Southern Fried True Crime covers cases that are not suitable for young listeners, and there may also be some explicit language used. Listener discretion is advised. I hate covering serial killers. I've probably said this before. Often, it becomes the horrific recitation of numerous sexual sadist-type murders. Usually, one of the reasons those killers are so hard for me to cover is that there isn't always enough information on their victims. The killer's MO doesn't change that much, and I hate feeling that I am just giving physical characteristics of the victims, their gruesome deaths, as they fade together. Serial killer Gary Ray Bowles is different. We don't know everything about his victims, but they weren't sex workers on the fringes of society without family or friends to remember them. Actually, it was the other way around. Gary was a handsome and charming male sex worker, a hustler. His victims were all gay men, ranging in ages from 37 to 72 at least for the six murders attributed to Bowles. He bragged to author Mary Brett that it was really seven murders. And as most killers, he blamed his childhood. You can find dueling academic research on whether or not psychopaths are natural born or made from society. Most experts believe it is a combination. But most serial killers aren't usually just born. They are raised. They are formed by their upbringing. In 2016, Bowles wrote a letter to the author Mary Brett saying, quote, Each murder was for different reasons, but when I did the first one, I seen something that caused me to remember something from when I was nine years old, and it caused me to snap and kill for the first time. After the first murder, I knew my life was over, and that led me to kill six more times. The FBI never charged me with the seventh murder, but I've proved I did it, and they still won't charge me. He was right. In the end, he was only officially tried for three murders, though he is publicly known for six murders. But it's very possible he got a taste for killing 10 years before his actual serial spree took place in 1994. Welcome to episode 165, the I-95 killer, or the serial killer, Gary Ray Bowles. In December of 1984, in a Tampa Bay trailer park called La Tropical Oaks, 82-year-old John Oliver Bragel was found on the floor of his living room. It appeared there had been a bloody, brutal struggle, which began in his bedroom. The retired Air Force warrant officer had been dead for two days. Detectives believed the fight started in the bedroom because blood was found on the bed, curtains, and ceiling, all consistent with a vicious bludgeoning. But John, retired Air Force, didn't go down that easily. Investigators found a trail that led to his bathroom where blood was smeared everywhere. It looked like someone had tried to clean up the blood with a towel, and then that someone had showered afterwards, and then must have left, or was still in the shower, unaware that John wasn't dead. Because John Bragle got up and staggered to his living room, probably hoping to reach his telephone to call for help, but he fell dead before he made it there, collapsing on the floor close to the phone. A friend found his body after getting worried when he hadn't seen John for a couple of days. The murder weapon was never found. The police told his family it looked to be a crime of passion because it was so brutal. John's credit cards and his 1983 Cadillac were stolen. The credit cards were used to rent a local motel room and buy two tanks of gas, but the Cadillac was never found. Detectives discovered that John had been hanging around with a younger man he had befriended and let stay in his mobile home. This man had been seen with John on the last day he was seen alive. Ten years later, 
homicide detectives would see many similarities to John's murder and the murders of six other gay men. Those murders were attributed to the serial killer known as the I-95 killer, Gary Ray Bowles. However, John Oliver Bragel remains on Pinellas County's Unsolved Murders website. Gary Ray Bowles was born on January 25, 1962, in Clifton Forge, Virginia, to parents William and Francis. Gary's father died before he was born. He was a coal miner who got black lung. His mother remarried, and until Gary was six or seven, he had a pretty good childhood. But then Gary's stepfather started abusing him. His mother divorced the man and later remarried a man named Chet. Chet was physically and mentally abusive. He beat Gary with belts and fists. He also beat Gary's mother in front of her children. She was hospitalized multiple times. Gary's mother and brother later testified that for four or five years, Gary was beaten up daily. He started using drugs and alcohol when he was just a kid. By age 10, he was sniffing glue and huffing paint. He often struggled with alcohol abuse, as did many of his family members. Later, the court would define Gary as an alcoholic. When Gary was 13, after they'd had enough of Chet's abuse, he and his brother beat their second stepfather with a rock, and he almost died. Gary told his mother to choose him or her husband. She chose her husband. Then Gary left home and didn't go back. After leaving home, Gary didn't go back to school and he was homeless. The first man who picked Gary up hitchhiking offered Gary money for sex, and he said yes. He was 14 years old. He would continue having sex with men for money for the next 18 years and embark on quite the criminal career before becoming a murderer. Between 1981 and November 1994, Gary was arrested at least 14 times in Florida. On September 27, 1982, in Tampa, Gary was convicted of sexual battery, sodomy, and aggravated sexual battery and was sentenced to three years. On June 4, 1982, Gary had been living with his girlfriend for around a month. One night, they were drinking and smoking pot when Gary attacked her. The attack left her with contusions on her head, face, neck, and chest, as well as bites to her breasts. She suffered internal injuries, including lacerations to her vagina and rectum. Luckily, she was too drunk to remember the attack. A Tampa detective said, I've seen better-looking bodies in an autopsy. Just over a year later, Gary was released on probation in December of 1983. But in November of 1987, Gary was back in prison for violating his probation. He was charged with sexual battery with the threat of a deadly weapon. Of all the details in Bowles' case history, there is not much on this one. I'm not sure if it was a man or a woman. Though at this time in his life, so far, his violence had been toward women, with the exception of his stepfather. And we know he was released from prison in April of 1990. And then he committed a string of robberies, each growing in severity. It was Grand Theft Auto in August of 1990 graduating to another grand theft for something valued at less than $20,000. Then he escalated to violence when he shoved a woman down and stole her purse in February of 1991. Finally, on July 18, 1991, Gary was sentenced for both grand theft charges and the robbery charge. He was given five years for grand theft and four years for robbery. But in December 1993, Gary was again released on probation. He moved to Daytona Beach, where he lived with his girlfriend. But Gary continued to work as a sex worker. 
When his girlfriend found out what he did for work, she left him. She also had an abortion without telling Gary first. He was furious and would later blame gay men for their breakup. But I really don't think it's that simple. First of all, it's completely unfair to blame his girlfriend for Gary's murders. Second of all, Gary had proven to be a very violent man many times before this, most notably for the girlfriend he spent over a year in jail for brutalizing. I think it's safe to say he was an equal opportunity violent offender. But what Gary had learned is that as a hustler, as they were called then, he could get gay men to trust him, especially older gay men who had more money. He would often go to gay bars, hustle men in exchange for a place to stay or sexual favors, stay with them for a while, kill them, and rob them. An article by Todd Simmons said that Gary only received oral sex from the men he hustled. Gary did not allow the men to have sex with him. This is a very specific detail that may have had a deeper meaning to Gary. You'll understand why soon. In March of 1994, Gary Ray Bowles was living in the Daytona Beach area. He met a man named John Roberts. 59-year-old John offered Gary a place to live, and Gary quickly took him up on the offer. John Hardy Roberts was born on May 2, 1934, in Madisonville, Tennessee, to parents John and Willie. He worked as an insurance agent. A few days after Gary moved in with John on March 14, 1994, John got upset with Gary after learning that Gary had made long-distance calls to a lady friend. Gary later said John thought he had a meaningful relationship with him. John thought it wasn't just sex. John gave Gary an ultimatum, pick the lady friend or him, which made Gary angry. John was sitting on a couch in the living room, and Gary was in the dining room, which was behind John. Gary picked up a lamp, which had a square metal base with a glass globe attached to the shaft, and removed the lampshade. He snuck up behind John and hit him in the head repeatedly with the lamp. But John didn't knock right out. Instead, he began struggling with Gary. Gary got on top of John and manually strangled him. When John was unconscious or dead, Gary stuffed a bloody rag in John's mouth. Gary then went through John's pockets and took his keys and wallet, and then he took off in John's car. At around 10.30 p.m., Gary tried to use John's debit card at an ATM, but couldn't guess the code. He was able to use John's credit cards between Florida and Tennessee for gas, motels, and other items. On March 15th at around 7.30 p.m., a friend found 59-year-old John's body on the floor of his living room and called the police. Police found no sign of forced entry, but they did find signs of a struggle in the living room, and they noticed John's 1992 Saturn and his wallet were missing. Interestingly, in a March 17th copy of The Sentinel, the headline was about Danny Rawling, the Gainesville Ripper. The notice about John Roberts didn't really read as another serial killer story yet. Police spoke with neighbors and found out that a man had been staying with John. Inside John's house, police found probation paperwork for John's roommate, Gary Bowles. Police started looking for Gary so they could talk to him. He wasn't necessarily a suspect. They just wanted to speak to him. But Gary was nowhere to be found. He disappeared after John's murder. An autopsy showed that John died from a combination of blunt force trauma and asphyxiation. He also had a fractured neck. He was viciously bludgeoned before strangled, and then a bloody rag was shoved down his throat. On March 25th, John's car was found abandoned in Nashville, Tennessee. While Daytona Beach police were investigating John's death, five more gay men would be murdered and robbed. 
On May 4, 1994, in Savannah, Georgia, Gary was seen with 72-year-old Milton Bradley, not to be confused with the board game company. Milt was a disabled World War II veteran and was well-known in downtown Savannah. Gary had offered to give Milton a ride home from a gay bar called Faces Tavern. About an hour later, Gary returned to the bar without Milton. Milton Joseph Bradley was born on September 16, 1921, in Georgia, to parents Aaron and Hannah. Milt had suffered a shrapnel wound in the war and was left with a brain injury. He lived on a $25 a day allowance from his family, who owned a historic lock and key business in downtown Savannah. He was known around Savannah as a kind, gentle old man who liked to feed the pigeons in the park. On May 5th, 72 year old Milton Bradley was found dead behind a utility shed near the Savannah Golf Club. He had been strangled, and his mouth had been filled with leaves, dirt, and twigs. Milton's pockets were turned inside out. Local PD thought the area the body was found in to be really strange. Milt was very much a staple of downtown Savannah. Everyone knew him there. This golf course was miles from downtown where Milt was known. An autopsy showed that Milton had been beaten so badly that the bones in his neck were broken. Dirt, leaves, and twigs had been shoved so far into his throat that the M.E. said they filled a small hospital towel. Savannah detectives were disturbed by the violent murder of such an innocent old man. They put out a bulletin on NCIC, or the National Crime Information Center, and they soon got a hit on a similar murder, though it was a much younger gay man. 37-year-old Albert Morris met Gary at a gay bar in Jacksonville. Gary said he was a construction worker whose name was Joey Pearson. Al befriended Gary, slash Joey, and let him stay in his house in exchange for fixing up the place. His home was located in Hilliard, Florida, about a half hour from Jacksonville. Hilliard is in Nassau County, who would later head up the investigation. Albert Alcee Morris was born on March 11, 1957, in Jacksonville, Florida. He worked as a manager of a convenience store his parents owned. Al, as he was known, was openly gay, and his friends said he was a very gregarious man. He had a large group of friends, who soon became worried about his house guest. He had started having trouble with his leech of a house guest, the man knew as Joey Pearson. On May 18th, Al and Gary slash Joey got into an argument and a physical fight outside of a bar. The argument was about how Joey wasn't holding up his end of the deal. He wasn't fixing up Al's place. One of Al's friends later said he broke up the two men fighting at least three times and begged Al to let him take him home. But Al didn't listen, and as he and Joey left the bar, they were still arguing. As he was leaving, Al swore to friends that he was going to make this Joey Pearson do his work. Back at the house, the physical fight quickly turned deadly. Gary hit Al over the head with a candy dish, and the two men began struggling. Al grabbed a kitchen knife to defend himself, but Gary quickly took the knife away from him. Then Al reached for his shotgun, and again, Gary Bowles overpowered him. Blood was found on the barrel and butt of the shotgun, matching devastating defensive wounds on Al's body. Gary then shot Al in his upper abdomen, but Al still didn't die. He fought like hell to the bitter end. Gary finally strangled Al and shoved a towel down his throat. He then ransacked Al's home, leaving a palm print, but not a fingerprint, on the TV console. He showered and then took Al's credit cards and his car. On May 19th, Al was supposed to work, but he never showed up. His family went to his house and discovered a horrific scene. 
the blood smeared home showed that Al had fought hard for his life. Gary used Al Morris's credit card to buy gas and clothes at a Walmart and then ditched the car in Jacksonville. Police found it three days later. Nassau County Police attempted to find Joey Pearson, but soon realized it was an alias. They searched NCIC and found out that the murder of Al Morris was similar to the murder of Milton Bradley in Savannah. So they started working with the Savannah Police Department. Nassau police got a composite sketch of Joey Pearson and sent it to Savannah. One of Milton's friends recognized him as the guy who Milton left Face's tavern with. He had been hanging around the gay bars. Another man said he had been drinking beer with the guy near the golf course where Milton's body was found. He said they stopped for beer at a convenience store. As luck would have it, the store had a grainy video of the man seen with Milton. Savannah cops sent the tape to Nassau County, Florida, and Al's friends identified the man they knew as Joey Pearson. After this, both departments, Georgia and Florida, began working with the FBI. The FBI created a profile of the killer. He was a psychopath who may not necessarily be gay. His M.O. was parasitic, as one detective called it. He preyed on gay men but he also had a disdain for them. He befriended them, stayed with them in their homes until he wore out his welcome, and then he murdered them, taking their credit cards and vehicles. In the beginning of June 1994, the FBI put out an alert about the deaths. Police from other East Coast cities started looking over their cases to see if there were similarities. The Daytona police contacted the FBI to say they had a similar murder, 59-year-old John Roberts, who I told you about earlier. Roberts was the man who lived in a beachfront house and was bludgeoned with a lamp, strangled, and had a bloody rag shoved down his throat. Sorry to not go in order of Gary Bowles' crimes, but it makes more sense now to follow the investigation at this point. Anyway. Daytona Beach Police relayed the horrific details of John's murder and stolen credit cards and car. But this time, Georgia, Florida, and the FBI finally got a break. In John Roberts' home, they found probation paperwork for a man named Gary Ray Bowles. They quickly found out his long criminal history and put out a bulletin to several states on the East Coast. A Savannah detective made a flyer with Gary's mugshot and had them posted all over gay bars. Then The Advocate, the leading LGBTQ magazine in the U.S., did a cover story on Bowles under the heading Natural Born Killer. Now Gary's name was all over the media, and the FBI put him on their most wanted list. He was featured on the television show America's Most Wanted five times. Sometimes, Gary was referred to as the I-95 killer. Investigators looking at a map could see that Gary was traveling through the I-95 corridor, even if he was going back and forth. More departments contacted the FBI, which led them to connect Gary to two more murders. A private investigator in Atlanta called to report a similar murder of a 47-year-old man named Alverson Carter Jr. His family had hired the P.I., Alverson had been viciously stabbed to death, and a towel had been stuck in his mouth. Atlanta PD had a suspect who had been seen with Carter in a gay bar. This murder happened on May 13th, just nine days after Milton Bradley's murder. And this was Gary's first stabbing. But remember, he had also used a shotgun that he had been able to take from Al Morris. He was using weapons of opportunity. Investigators were even more worried at this escalation, and then they found a murder that happened before Milton's. On April 13, 1994, a month before Milton's murder, 39-year-old David Jarman was seen drinking at a gay bar in Washington, D.C. He left the bar with Gary. He would technically be Gary's first murder. I say technically, because this is 1994, 
not 1984, but we'll get back to that. David Allen Jarman was born on December 3, 1954, to parents Alton and Ruth. He was a loan processor for a credit union. On April 14, David's body was found in his Silver Spring, Maryland home. He had been strangled and beaten to death. A dildo had been shoved down his throat. For Gary's first murder, he had chosen a sex toy to put in his victim's throat. After that, he would use whatever he found handy, often rags or towels. Milton's throat had been filled with dirt, leaves, and twigs because his body was found outdoors. The other victims were killed in their homes. If the journalist Todd Simmons was right, it could have something to do with the fact that Gary Bowles claimed to have only allowed gay men to perform oral sex on him. But I say that with a firm caveat, that he was also convicted of sodomy of a woman. I don't think anyone can say for sure what Gary's sexuality was, much less his motive. One detective I saw on a true crime show pointed out that shoving something down someone's throat is an extremely cruel and brutal way to die. It's suffocation on top of strangulation, which is terrifying and painful, and it can still be seen as sexual in nature as it is such a personal violent act. You have to be on top of the other person, holding them down to do this, looking them in the eyes. David Jarman's wallet and car were also missing, just like the other victims. Silver Spring is around 20 minutes from D.C., where David was last seen drinking in a gay bar, talking to a guy who looked like Gary Bowles. On April 14th, Gary used David's driver's license and credit card to book a motel in Baltimore. But he used a previous address of his own, which police were later able to use to connect Gary to David's death. They were even able to match his handwriting to his probation papers. Motel employees told police that Gary spoke in Spanish and said that he was from Alexandria, Virginia. On April 20th, David's car was found abandoned in front of a gay bar in Baltimore. In June, the Baltimore police went around the gay community showing mugshots of Gary. They said he was a clean-cut, smooth-talking hustler who passes himself off as a construction worker or prostitute and meets victims in gay bars. What police didn't know was that in June, Gary was in Jacksonville, Florida. He was living on the streets, hanging out in bars, and working odd jobs. The killing stopped, and Gary faded out of the media. While Gary was living on the streets of Jacksonville, a man named Jay Hinton approached him and asked if he would like to help him move some furniture. In return, Gary could stay with Jay for a few weeks. Gary helped Jay move some personal items from Georgia to Jay's home in Jacksonville, and then Gary started living with Jay. This worked out for a while, but eventually Jay kicked Gary out. Gary was arrested. Then two weeks later, he was able to work himself back into Jay's house. Walter Jamel J. Hinton was born on May 1, 1952. He was a floral designer. A couple weeks after Gary moved back in with Jay on November 16, 1994, Jay had a friend named Richard over. Jay, Richard, and Gary drank beer and smoked some pot. Richard would later say that Gary didn't match Jay. He was unkempt with dirty fingernails. Something just didn't seem right. When it was time for Richard to leave, Gary went with Jay to take Richard to the train station. Gary kept drinking and had at least six beers on the drive. Richard said Gary was totally gone by the time he was dropped off at the train station, which was around 7.30 p.m. When Gary and Jay got home, Jay went to sleep and Gary kept drinking in the living room. At some point, he went outside unearthed a 40-pound concrete stepping stone and brought it inside and put it on a table. After thinking for a few minutes, Gary took the stone, 
went into Jay's room and dropped it on Jay's head. This caused a fracture that extended from Jay's right cheek to his jaw. Jay was stunned and fell from the bed. And yet somehow, Jay came up fighting. I think that is some of the difference in seeing these crime scenes than when women are murdered. Men were able to fight back, sometimes after horrific injuries that would knock out if not kill most people. Just about every crime scene associated with Gary Bowles was extremely bloody and littered with broken glass and furniture. After Jay got back up, Gary began strangling him. While strangling him, Jay started hemorrhaging on the right side of his neck. Two bones in his neck had been fractured. Once Jay was unconscious or dead, Gary stuffed toilet paper into Jay's throat, then put a rag in his mouth. He wrapped Jay's body in sheets and bedspreads and hid the body in the bathroom. He took Jay's watch, car keys, stereo equipment, and his car. He drove Jay's car to buy more liquor. Then he picked up a homeless woman named Jennifer at the beach and brought her back to Jay's. Jennifer was suffering from pleurisy, and Gary said he wanted to get her out of the bad weather. It is strange how Gary could sometimes be gentle with women. Maybe it was just that she was homeless like he was. At some point, Gary dropped Jennifer off somewhere and then went back to Jay's place. The last time Gary was seen driving Jay's car was three days after Jay was found dead. On November 22nd, after Jay didn't answer any phone calls or answer his door for several days, Jay's sister and her fiancé broke into his residence and found him dead. 42-year-old Jay's cause of death was asphyxia. He also suffered five broken ribs and multiple abrasions on his arms and legs. Jay did not have any brain damage from the concrete stone. This showed that Jay had not rendered him unconscious after the stone hit him. The medical examiner believed Jay was strangled to death or to unconsciousness. Then the toilet paper was stuffed into his throat. Police found out that a man named Tim had been living with Jay. There was some paperwork with the name Timothy Whitfield in the house. Police just thought he was a roommate or friend and wanted to talk to him. They weren't sure he was a suspect. Detectives asked some street informants and found out that a Tim Whitfield had rented a room in a boarding house and that he had been working temp jobs. Jacksonville police did not initially connect Gary Bowles and Jay's death since he had not been mentioned in the media for almost six months. On November 22, 1994, at 5.30 a.m., Jacksonville police received a call from someone kind of whispering into the phone that a Tim Whitfield was at the Ameriforce Job Center trying to get a job for the day. It was a place where day laborers went. Officers headed to the job center to arrest Tim Whitfield so they could question him about his roommate's death. On the show called The Mark of Death, investigators said that detectives in the room questioning who they thought was Tim Whitfield became very confrontational. Think a lot of yelling and slamming fists on the table. And then a detective yelled, I've had it with this lying. This show of uber masculinity and physical force provoked Gary, which caused the man they thought was Tim Whitfield to stand up and scream, Do you know who I really am? I'm a wanted man. I'm Gary Ray Bowles. The man from the FBI's wanted list. Obviously, police were incredulous, but it wasn't hard to check out his story. And soon, Gary Bowles confessed to all six murders. Gary told police that he adopted the identity of Tim Whitfield shortly after killing Albert Morris. He had found ID cards, a birth certificate, and a social security card with Whitfield's name in Albert's trailer. Police said they didn't know why Timothy's documents were there, and I'm not sure if they ever even talked to the real guy. 
Police didn't initially believe Gary's story about the alias, but in his back pocket, Gary had Whitfield's birth certificate and social security card. Gary said he even served a five-day jail sentence for a traffic offense under the real Whitfield's name because he didn't want to give up the alias. Gary confessed to killing six men, John Roberts, David Jarman, Milton Bradley, Alverson Carter Jr., Albert Morris, and Jay Hinton. Gary told the detectives he was glad he had been arrested because the killings will stop. Gary said the killing started after his girlfriend got an abortion and left him. Gary said he put things in the victims' throats so that if they regained consciousness, they wouldn't be able to breathe. Which, if you think about it, does make sense, if you believe there were really seven murders. But hang on. When asked if he was gay, Gary said he was straight. He said he was a hustler who just lived off these people. When asked if he had bisexual tendencies, Gary did say yes. When asked if there were any female victims, Gary never gave detectives a yes or no answer. He would change the subject. When talking about the male victims, Gary would freely admit in an almost boastful manner. Like I said, though he had shown extreme violence to women, he seemed more ashamed of that than of viciously murdering gay men. On May 17, 1996, Gary pled guilty to first-degree murder of Jay Hinton. He would not be sentenced for three years, though. On October 10, 1996, in a deal to take the death penalty off the table, Gary pled guilty to the first-degree murder of Albert Morris. He was sentenced to life in prison. On August 6, 1997, in a deal to take the death penalty off the table again, Gary pled guilty to first-degree murder, armed burglary, robbery with a gun or deadly weapon, and grand theft in relation to the death of John Roberts. He was sentenced to three terms of life in prison for the murder, burglary, and robbery. For grand theft, he was given five years. But Gary was not charged with the other three murders he had confessed to, probably because he had received multiple life sentences and now the death penalty. On May 25, 1999, a jury was selected for the penalty sentencing phase for the murder of Jay Hinton. During the penalty phase, the prosecution laid out multiple aggravating factors to convince the jury that Gary deserved the death penalty. The aggravating factors included, first, that Gary had a violent criminal history. He had been convicted of brutally assaulting his girlfriend, with the charge including sodomy, and then pushing a woman down to steal her purse. He had also been sentenced for the two other murders in Florida. Also, Gary killed Jay during a robbery or an attempted robbery, and the murder of Jay was heinous, atrocious, or cruel. And finally, the murder of Jay was cold, calculated, and premeditated. And Gary said he had expected to find money on Jay or in his residence. When he didn't find any money, Gary felt stuck and unable to flee because he didn't have any money or anywhere else to go. This led prosecutors to believe robbery was a motive in killing Jay. The defense laid out multiple mitigating factors to convince the jury that Gary did not deserve the death penalty. The mitigating factors included, first, Gary's abusive childhood, then his history of alcoholism, Gary's absence of a true father figure, that he was extremely disturbed at the time of the murder, that he had diminished capacity to appreciate the criminality of his acts at the time of the murder, that he had cooperated with the police in this murder, and others, and finally, that Gary was drinking and doing drugs at the time of the murder. Gary said he felt something snap inside him, and that's when he went to get the stone to kill Jay. Part of Gary's defense was that he was really drunk at the time of the murder. 
He said he drank six beers on the way to drop off Jay's friend at the train station and continued drinking when he got home. But the prosecution said he couldn't have been that drunk. Gary was able to wait for Jay to fall asleep, unearth the stepping stone, bring it inside, quietly enter Jay's room, aim the stone so that it fell on Jay's head, and then fight off Jay. Not to mention all the things Gary did after the murder, like driving to the liquor store and picking up a woman. The prosecution told the jury that Jay Hinton was a gay man, and Gary did not like gay men. They said, in fact, Gary had two former girlfriends who left him because of his lifestyle. The defense immediately objected and moved for a mistrial because the state had just discussed inadmissible evidence. They were not supposed to bring up any evidence that wasn't related to the aggravating factors. The questions about Gary's sexuality and his work as a gay hustler were not brought up as aggravating factors. The state said the evidence of Gary's sexuality and his hatred for gay men was relevant for establishing the motive of Jay's killing. The trial judge overruled the defense's objection, and the trial continued. On May 27th, the jury recommended the death penalty. The judge followed the jury's recommendation and sentenced Gary Ray Bowles to death on September 6th, 1996. All of Gary's subsequent appeals, post-conviction relief petitions, and clemency proceedings ultimately failed. Two different psychiatrists found that Gary Bowles had mild to moderate frontal lobe issues, which caused poor impulse control and a lack of empathy. However, it was clear that he knew right from wrong, which, as we know, is the basis for an incompetency defense in this country. Gary knew what he did was wrong. He just did not care. On August 22, 2019, the Supreme Court of the United States denied Gary's application for a stay of execution. While execution preparations were being made, Gary ate three cheeseburgers, french fries, and bacon. He released a statement to the press saying, I'm sorry for all of the pain and suffering I have caused. I never wanted this to be my life. You don't wake up one day and decide to become a serial killer. His words don't really mean anything, though. When he was featured in the A&E series, The Killer Speaks, he said he thought the men deserved to die, and he wanted to kill as many people as he could before they caught him. At 10.58 p.m. on August 22, 2019, 57-year-old Gary Ray Bowles was executed. He was the 99th person to be executed in Florida since 1976 when the death penalty was restored by the Supreme Court. Gary's murders have been compared to female Florida serial killer Eileen Warnos. But back to what Gary wrote to author Mary Brett. He wrote, The FBI never charged me with the seventh murder, but I've proved I did it, and they still won't charge me. When I was reading all the sources on Haley's list, I found the cold case about John Bragle from 1984 and an article about John Roberts in the Tampa Bay Times from June 1994. The article was written during the time that Gary Ray Bowles was still a fugitive. John Bragle was murdered in Seminole, Florida, which is in Pinellas County. A spokesperson for Pinellas said, quote, it's routine for law enforcement to share information on crimes. If there's anything promising, we'll put the elements of our case back in the hopper and see what we can develop. To me, her statement is flippant or blasé. Like, we'll check it out and get back to you. Not taking it seriously. Maybe I am reading too much into all this, but there are too many similarities. John Bragle was older. He lived in a trailer and there were definite signs of a struggle. Like the other victims, he was befriended by a younger man shortly before his murder. And while the newspaper doesn't give details about his murder, they do characterize it as the same overkill that Bowles had with all of his other murders. 
This murderer also attempted to clean up with towels, possibly showering after the murder. The one thing that is different is there's no mention of anything shoved in Bragel's mouth or throat. But we know that police often hold back details hoping to catch the killer. But why that detail? Unless it really wasn't there. The article was already detailing Bowles' other murders. However, it does not mention the detail of objects shoved in the victim's mouths in those murders either. At the time of this article, remember, he was still a fugitive, so maybe this was the one detail they were holding back on all of the murders. And maybe John Bragel's murder is just not connected. Or maybe Gary Bowles learned a lesson after 82-year-old John Bragel managed to get back up and stagger to the living room for the phone. Maybe that is why he started shoving things down his victims' throats. Remember, Gary said he put things in the victims' throats so that if they regained consciousness, they would not be able to breathe. Even the Pinellas spokesperson leaves open the possibility of a connection. The article said the description of the man in the Bruegel murder does not match Gary Bowles, but the spokesperson pointed out that 10 years can change a person. John Bragel's family, on the other hand, said they felt that the Pinellas Sheriff's Department did not pursue the case because John was gay. Maybe his family was right. We would like to think the police did not behave that way, but we also know there is a big difference in how gays were treated in the 80s than in the 90s. And I don't think this is just small-town crap either. There are almost a million people in that county, and the force would have, or at least should have, reflected a population that large and diverse. But the population of the town of Seminole remains under 20,000 and had less than 5,000 residents at the time of John Bragel's murder. So maybe it was some small-town bullshit. But even the worst of police departments don't want cold cases sitting in their files, especially when they can be linked to such an infamous serial killer. I would love to know how they ruled Gary Ray Bowles out on this murder, because, as I said, Pinellas still lists John Bruegel's murder as unsolved. John had family who loved him and deserved answers. All the men who Gary Bowles viciously murdered had family and friends who loved them. It is painful to think that one family was not given closure if there is a chance Pinellas made a mistake. Gary admitted to all the murders, and he told author Mary Brett that he told the FBI about the seventh. Was his seventh victim John Bruegel? But both men are dead now, And dead men tell no tales. Southern Fried True Crime is hosted and produced by me, Erica Kelly. Today's episode was researched by me and Haley Gray. And today's episode was written by me. Southern Fried's original music is by Rob Harrison of Gamma Radio. And the original graphic art is by Coley Horner. If you have any case suggestions, please go to my website and click on the Listener Suggestion tab. This is the best way for me to get those little-known cases y'all always send me. Please remember that I do not accept suggestions on social media, private messages, or in the comments. With three platforms to manage, that is very overwhelming for me. I hope you understand. But please come join our Facebook group, Southern Fried True Crime Fans Discussion Group, where we swap recipes, worship Dolly Parton, and share memes. I much prefer spending my social media time in our lovely group. We do, of course, discuss true crime, not just Southern fraud, but all kinds. But it is still very much a Southern lifestyle group, and you should know that if you're thinking of joining, because we don't like people complaining that there's not enough true crime in our group. Don't worry, there is plenty of crime, but it is a really fun group, and we want to welcome you. Our group is a safe and fun corner of Facebook, and by God, we mean it when we say no shit ass is allowed. 
It's not just a motto. It's how we run the group. If you enjoyed today's show, don't forget to subscribe and please tell a friend or rate and review on iTunes. I'm also on all large platforms like iHeart, Stitcher, Spotify, and now Amazon and Audible. Until next time, thanks so much for listening. Y'all take care.